Hey there, Slashaholics. Before we start tonight, I want to say a big thank you to all the patrons of this channel, because without them, the channel would simply not exist. So, a very big thank you to Jay Gardner, Michael Clark, The Jersey Devil, Jason Epstein, Alex Vanover, Carl of Cthulhu, Chris Dozier, Cinerenic CAX, EXC3LS10R84, Gucci Solo, Iron Alexa, Jackson Smith, Jordan Nicholson, Callie Gamer Girl 82, Catherine McClear, Katie Sabo, Kodo Bukia, Transformers Bishoho, Marshall Jenkins, Morgan Cherney, Nick Valcarve, Peyton Loeb, William Schaefer, Yusuf McRae, Alvaro M., Jacob Hill, Jeremy Wilson, Casey Hawaii, Liam Anderson, Scar, Donovan Shelton, EGSCW, Landon Turner, Mr. D. Authier, Nick, and Serpent Thrope. Thank you all so much. We really appreciate you. And if anybody listening would like to help support the channel to keep it going and growing for years to come, please consider joining our Patreon, making a PayPal or Cash App donation, or even ordering a Cameo video. All the information and links to do any of these is in the description and pinned comment below. We can't monetize the channel here on YouTube, so we really depend on slashaholics like you to keep the channel going. Thank you all so much, and please enjoy tonight's narration of Jason Goes to Hell, The Final Friday, the fan novelization by Jeremy Terry. Interlude number two, from the journal of Elias Voorhees, found among the papers of Pamela Voorhees, June 14th, 1946. The ritual worked. My son Jason Voorhees was born at the stroke of midnight on Friday the 13th of June in the year of our Lord 1946. He was quite a large child and his mouth formed, but he is alive nonetheless. Pamela worships him. I do not think she has spared me a single glance since the boy drew his first breath. It truly is love at first sight. I myself have reservations. He is singularly the oddest infant I have ever laid eyes on or even heard mention of. He did not cry upon his birth, even when Dr. French spanked him. He has not uttered a single sound. There is something about his eyes as well, something knowing and far too intelligent. It is as if a greater and much older presence resides behind his eyes. I must confess that I feared that something like this might happen. I studied that vile book, the Necronomicon Ex Mortis, the fabled book of the dead, from cover to cover. I felt the soft leather of the human skin in, it, in which it is bound against my palms. I stared into the rudimentary face that adorned the cover, its features stretched into a rictus of agony. I have read the words written in human blood. The passage spoke of demonic entities who yearned to escape their prison and roam our world. I was so careful, I made sure of every syllable that I was to utter. But what if I made a mistake? What if I conjured more than a boon for my wife? What if my infant son now plays host to one of the things spoken of in the text? These deadites. The thought is too ghastly to fathom. It chills me to my very marrow. I will have to keep a close watch on little Jason as he grows. It is in the demon's nature to destroy everything around it. I will not let that happen, no matter how much Pamela loves him. I looked up as I finished writing that last line and locked eyes with the baby. He lay swaddled in his mother's arms, still in silence as the grave and he was staring at me as if he could read my mind and understand what I had just wrote. The thing that I fear inhabits him is watchful. I must be ever cautious.
Chapter 6 Josh The lights inside Joey B's diner were out for the night, and an unaccustomed silence had fallen over the place. Diana walked through the building and stepped out into the cool fall air, two trash bags clutched in her hands. She paused on the threshold to look around the back lot. It was lit by one dim street light, and the shadows seemed deep as the ocean. Fear blossomed in her chest, and she welcomed it as an old friend. She was used to living with fear, had been taught how to from earliest childhood. Diana knew who her father was, though she had no memory of him. Elias Voorhees never divorced Pamela, and therefore he had never made an honest woman out of Diana's mother, Martha Kimball. She thought that might be the source of her dislike for the idea of marriage, but guessed that she still owed her father thanks. How much worse might life have been had she been born with the last name of Voorhees? Elias was long gone by the time Diana was born in the summer of 1961. Her mother had always said her good-for-nothing father had struck out for greener pastures, but Diana had a different idea for her brother had already drowned at Camp Crystal Lake, and Pamela had already claimed the lives of her first two victims. No, Diana thought that Elias Voorhees was running for his life. She was 19 years old when Pamela finally went off the deep end, killed Steve Christie and his counselors, and then lost her head. It should have been over. But it wasn't. Unbelievably, Jason came home. The murders went on and on, destroying the small community's peace. With each new death, Diana would think, Now everyone will find out my dirty little secrets. They'll look at me with blame in their eyes and hurt on their tongues, never stopping to think that my parentage doesn't make me guilty of my family's crimes. So she hid her past away and deflected any questions that might lead down a path she was loath to tread. As far as she knew, there were only three people alive who knew who she was, her daughter, herself, and Creighton Duke. Now she was planning on letting another person in. Was it really a good idea to let Stephen know her family's story? She remembered the bounty hunter's dire warning from earlier that day, and something inside spoke up. She, Jessica, and the baby were in real danger, and they needed help. Love was a greater motivator than greed. Regardless of his accolades, Diana couldn't find it in herself to trust Creighton Duke, but she thought she could trust Stephen Freeman. Diana sighed and started across the parking lot towards the dumpster at the rear of the diner. Her footsteps echoed off the cinder block facade of the building, doubling, making it sound like someone were coming up behind her. A shiver ran down her spine, and the urge to run came upon her. She pushed it back down, determined to not act like the frightened little girl she felt like. She reached the dumpster and pushed the lid up, holding her breath against the rancid stench of slowly rotting vegetables and meat that wafted out. Jason has his chance right now, she thought, as she tossed the bags in. This would be a hell of a way to go, head stuffed into a pile of Joey's leftovers. She closed the dumpster and turned right into a large shape that loomed over her out of the dark. Jesus! Diana shouted, her hands raised to fight off her attacker. She lowered them just as quickly when she realized who was standing there. Uh, uh, sorry, Di, Deputy Josh said, looking contrite. I, I, I was just going to my car. I didn't mean to frighten you. It's all right. I'm just a little on edge tonight. The scene with the bounty hunter guy bothered me more than I thought it would. Josh put a hand on her shoulder, leading her back to the diner's rear entrance. Don't fret over that asshole. He's cooling his jets in a cell down at the station house. I promise you he'll be run out of town on a rail by tomorrow night. He won't bother you again. I wish that was all it took to put me at ease, she thought. Tell me, Josh... Can you and Ed run my evil brother out of town? Nobody has been able to do it yet, she thought. She smiled and squeezed his hand as they reached the door. Thanks. That makes me feel better. And listen, he said, winking at her. Don't you worry about it. He'll come around. He's too good a sheriff to let you give him the slip. Diana crossed her arms and leaned against the door frame. I don't know, Josh. I graduated high school a long time ago. 
I'm too old for going steady. So is he, and he knows it. Everything will work out. Trust me on that. Okay, she said, giving him a hug. Good night, Josh. Good night, beautiful, he said. He watched her go inside the diner and then walked over to a tan car parked near the tree line at the back of the parking lot. A, a familiar figure stepped out to greet him. Hey, darling, he said as he wrapped his arms around his not-so-secret lover, Edna Walsh. She was an attractive woman a few years younger than Josh with brown hair and an hourglass figure. To Josh, she looked like a classic movie star from the 40s and 50s. He leaned in to kiss her, and she pulled away, blushing. Not here, dummy. What if someone sees us? Josh shrugged. Who is going to see us here, Bigfoot? I don't know, she said, looking around at the quiet parking lot. It doesn't hurt to be careful. I'm sorry I'm late, Muffin. It's all right. Bill didn't go bowling at the regular time. Edna shook her head. The league changed the damn time, but it's okay. We still have until 10.30. Come on, hop in. Edna didn't have to tell him twice. He walked to the passenger side door while she moved to the driver's side. She had her door open and was crouching down to slip inside when Philip Hunt burst from the forest. Josh and Edna didn't have time to blink before he was on top of them. He struck the driver's side door and slammed it on Edna's head with bone-crushing force. Josh saw her skull collapse under the tremendous blow, heard her cranium explode, saw blood and pulpy brain matter expel from her ears and nose. Edna collapsed in a heap, her killer already in motion again. Josh reached for his sidearm, pulled. The gun wouldn't come out. He had forgotten to push the thumb strap that secured the gun in its holster free. Haunt didn't give him another chance. He struck the deputy in the stomach with his shoulder, folding the man in half and knocking the breath from him. Josh fell backwards, struck his head on the asphalt, and knew no more. Josh drifted up from unconsciousness like a diver surfacing from the blackest depths and found he was unable to move. The scent of years of neglect filled his nostrils as well as the high stink of active decay. He opened his eyes and saw that he was strapped down to a metal table in an unfamiliar place. The walls were bare wood and lined with shelves, the roof overhead moldering plaster that sagged in places. Fear filled him and he struggled against the bonds across his ankles, hips, and hands, chest, and head. But was no use. He was stuck fast. A shadow moved to his left, drew closer to hover above him. It was the man who killed Edna. He was utterly unknown to Josh and was obviously very ill. His dark skin was covered in pestilential sores that oozed a thick black liquid. The smell coming from the fluid was like the smell of a fish left on a riverbank in the height of summer. The man leaned close, his nose almost touching Josh's, and a single drop of the pus fell on Josh's cheek. Josh gagged, his eyes growing wide in horror. Oh God! Oh Jesus, I'm going to choke to death on my own vomit! Josh struggled to fight his gorge back down as the man pulled a pearl-handled straight razor from his pocket and flipped it open in front of his eyes. Jason stared through the coroner's foggy eyes at the man he'd chosen, stared at the mustache growing there. He growled with deep-seated anger as old memories surfaced in his fevered mind. His father had had a mustache like the man's. Jason could see it in his mind, could see the white hairs mixed with the dark. He could remember watching it as his father berated him and his mother over and over again for small slights and mistakes. Jason hated his father, had in fact tried to kill him once at the urging of the voices in his head. He would not occupy a body that wore a mustache. Jason held the razor against the man's throat, letting him feel the cold certainty that he was about to die. Then he began to shave the man. He must be careful. He couldn't damage the host. He needed it to last. You 
fuck? Josh shouted as the man started to dry shave his neck and face with the razor. Careful as a practice surgeon. He wanted to thrash, to fight, but the slightest movement might spell disaster. He stared up into the man's black eyes, wanting to fight, to kill the man. The man stared back as he placed the razor beneath Josh's nose and raked it down. The blade was keen, yet the stroke still hurt. Two more swipes and the job was done. Josh felt cool air on his now clean shaven upper lip for the first time since he was in high school. The man seemed satisfied. He put the straight razor on the edge of the table and then undid the strap holding Josh's right hand. What the hell? What kind of kinky BDSM shit is this? Is he going to shave me and then let me go? But no, he immediately clamped a hand over Josh's wrist. The man might be sick, but he was still immensely strong and more than a match for Josh when he was in such a position of disadvantage. The man reached up with his other hand to force Josh's mouth open, and then he was leaning down, his mouth open wide. I was right! Kinky shit! Kinky! Something moved inside the man's mouth. It was covered in black bile and far too big to be the man's tongue. Their mouths met, and Josh felt something slithering into his and down his throat. He couldn't breathe. He was choking. His neck bulged grotesquely with the thing's passage. Then it was past his throat and burrowing deeper into his body. This was unbearable, an invasion of his very being. The man stumbled against the wall and began to scream as some great agony overcame him. It was too bad that Josh couldn't enjoy his pain because his own was just beginning. He could feel the thing twining through his guts and there were voices in his head. They cackled and howled obscenities, told him he was damned. Josh screamed, his voice in perfect harmony with the strangers, their voices filling the Voorhees' house with sounds it had not known for many years. Then, Josh was gone, and Jason looked out of fresh eyes. He reached across with his free hands and methodically undid each strap, freeing himself. He didn't spare a glance for the glistening pile of melting skin and bones that had once been Coroner Philip Haunt. The voices said it didn't matter, that it would melt away to nothing, but dust before the night was spent. They said focus on what was important. Jason Wood, his sister, was waiting for him. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been interlude number two and chapter six of Jason Goes to Hell, The Final Friday, the fan novelization by Jeremy Terry. Had a lot of fun with these. I really dig finding out about baby Jason Voorhees. <laughs> That's always fun. You know, anytime you can get a backstory on infant or toddler Jason, I'm all for it. Uh, finding out he was even a creepy infant. Scary as hell. Scared his dad. Yeah. Um, had fun with the chapter. Getting a little more backstory into Diana and, uh, you know, her relationship with Elias. Uh, the movie didn't really touch on that a whole lot. So I'm really glad that Jeremy's given us these additional touches to the story. You know, a little more insight into what's going on. Um, of course, the stuff with Josh uh, and, and Haunt switching bodies. I was real curious how Jeremy was going to handle this, if he was going to give us an explanation for the BDSM and the shaving. Uh, he had me laughing, had to do a couple takes when it came to the kinky shit. Um, but yeah, this, this was an amazing job done by Jeremy. He really gave us insights into Diana's past. Uh, the journal entries are giving us great insight to the Necronomicon's connection to Jason, at least with the Jason Goes to Hell story. Um, it really fills in a lot of holes. And uh, was very much appreciated to find out why Jason shaved Josh's body. Um, or Josh's face, mind you, I'm sorry. Explaining it uh, because he has a hatred for his father, Elias, who had a mustache, was a great idea. 
and I think a lot of people uh, like me are going to be pleased with that explanation. Um, you know, I had a long interview with Adam Marcus, and I think I asked him about it, and I can't quite remember what his answer was, but the interview's here on the channel if you're interested. It is a three-hour interview, and it never gets dull or boring. Very entertaining interview uh, with the writer and director of Jason Goes to Hell. Uh, but yeah, Jeremy, you're doing a great job. Really enjoyed tonight's chapter and interlude. Please, everybody, be sure to thank Jeremy in the comment section for bringing this movie to us in novel form. And uh, let him know what you thought of tonight's chapters. And let me know. I love to hear from all of you. Uh, I'll be back very soon with more of Jason Goes to Hell by Jeremy Terry. Until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian saying, Thanks for listening. Be excellent to each other. And always remember, the sun never sets on those who ride into it. We'll see you soon.